Okay. It's just a bow and look to the Lord in prayer before we do this last session. Father, we're so conscious of the need of divine help. Uh, we, uh, again, believe your scriptures when it says, unless the Lord build the house, those that labor, labor in vain that build it. And so we need thy help, Lord. And uh, we've, ne we've needed it all weekend, but we need it in this last session. And we do pray you'll speak to us and that we'd have hearts that are tender and receptive to what you would have to say to us. And you'd encourage us uh, through the scriptures, which give hope. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, I want to read from verse 26 now, please, as we've got the final two festivals. Which would be the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. And these are all in the fall of the year. They're all in the seventh month. Uh, it's kind of interesting that you have the Feast of Pentecost, which is in uh, the third month, and then you don't have anything till the seventh month. There's a long gap and nothing seems to happen. And then when it begins to happen, it all happens really quickly. <laughs> and it's like that now. We're in the, uh, this harvest period, and it seems like nothing's happening. But once it happens, it's going to happen really quick. We're going to see it all come together very beautifully and very quickly. So beginning in verse 26, please, of Leviticus 23, and we'll read down to verse 32. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, you shall do no work in that same day, for it's the day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul I will destroy from among his people. He shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls. The ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. Again, we want to uh, do what we did in the last session, in that the primary interpretation is connected with God's earthly people, Israel. The secondary application will be to his heavenly people, the church. So we want to start with Israel. And we're going to say that we said that Israel had three fundamental problems. They were a scattered people. They're a sinful people. And um, they're a suffering people. And we said that the Feast of Trumpets is going to answer the first one. They'll no longer be a scattered people. Uh, when God sends his angels and calls his elect, the elect nation, from the four winds of heaven, they're all going to be together in one place, in Jerusalem, in Israel. There's going to be a massive regathering of his people. But, but this gathered people are still going to be in their sin. And we see that even today there's a, been a partial regathering of Israel, but they're in their sin. Uh, in fact, um, they're a very secular nation. We tend to focus on the, you know, those religious zoos, the Jews, zoos, Jews, went back and forth, you know, at the Temple Mount, right now, and all that. But, but they're a minority in the nation. It's a very secular nation. In, in fact, uh, Tel Aviv, the capital, is the homosexual capital of the Middle East. This is Israel today. It's a very wicked place. Godless place, very godless. And so they're, they're a sinful people. And so that has to be dealt with. Before God can bring them into their glorious millennial age, he's got to do something. He's got to clean them up. They're, they're a sinful people. So how's he going to do that? Well, the Day of Atonement is going to answer to that. Now, what you notice on the Day of Atonement, the characteristics of this festival it's always good to look, what are the salient features of each of the festivals? And this, the salient feature of this one, there's actually two things that stand out in the Day of Atonement. 
One is there's this afflicting their souls. And so we, we notice that um, in verse um, verse 29, for instance. Uh, it, so it says, whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he who be cut off from among his people. Verse 32, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. And, and so uh, there's, there's this emphasis on afflicting their souls. Verse 27, on the 10th day of the seventh month shall be a day of atonement, shall be a holy convocation to you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering by fire unto the Lord. So this idea of afflicting their souls, and it's the idea of a deep kind of contrition, deep repentance, deep brokenness over their sinfulness. And so there's got to be this afflicting of their souls. So that's the first characteristic. We'll, we'll look at the second one in a moment, but uh, which is basically they were to do no servile work. But we want to think about this idea of afflicting their souls. When will this have its fulfillment? I want you to look, please, at the book of Zechariah. Now, again, keep your finger, please. Uh, or a marker or something in Leviticus 23. We'll come back there. But I want you to go to Zechariah. Now, I know Zechariah is not a regular book you look at, but if you go to Matthew and start working backwards, you won't be long before you're in Zechariah because you've got Malachi, if you go backwards, and then you've got Zechariah. And Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. And we'll break in in verse 8. And I want you to notice the phrase in that day, which is going to be repeated quite frequently. It says, in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. So let's just kind of put it in context here. So we said that Israel had been regathered. And they're all together in the land of Israel. And I believe that the Antichrist, the man of sin, will be delighted. In fact, I believe he'll even cooperate in allowing the Jews to come together in one place. Because in his mind is this thought. Here's my opportunity for the final solution. See, I believe Hitler was, a, a if you like, a, a pre-run of the, the man of sin. He wanted to bring about the final solution, but he failed, and, his, and Germany collapsed at the time and defeat. But the man of sin wants to do this. And so he'll be so delighted that they're all together. And so the armies of Antichrist are going to surround Jerusalem, and they're going to seek to wipe out the Jews once and for all. And we can enter into, we've already got rid of the Christians. They'll be rejoicing after the rapture, because we're holding that they'll believe that aliens or something has removed these, these, uh, these religious zealots out of our world so we can move forward and make progress. Uh, these are people that are holding us back. Humanity's been held back with these people stuck in this book written all those centuries ago. Let's, let, what a joy to get rid of these people. And now we just got the Jews. We get rid of them. Now we can move forward. Okay, that's going to be the mentality. And so, again, in Zechariah, in verse 9, so in verse 8, he talks about the fact that the Jews will fight fiercely. He that is feeble among them, verse 8, shall be as David. So the weakest Jew will be like David. Well, David is a mighty warrior, right? And, and uh, it says, the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. So, so, so collectively, they're going to be a powerful force to deal with their Israel. And it shall come and pass in that day, I'll seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I want you to notice that. All the nations. A, a, a worldwide unified military will come against Jerusalem. All the nations that come against Jerusalem. And then he says, I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. Let's just stop there. And so what's going to happen is these Jews, surrounded by all the nations of the world, 
And despite them fighting fiercely like David, right, they realize they can't win against such overwhelming odds. And God is going to pour upon them a spirit of grace and supplication. And, and so what's going to happen is they're going to start praying. Because when all hope is gone, what else can you do, right? We can't win. We're surrounded by all the armies of the earth. And it looks like we're about to perish from the earth. And they're going to pray. I even know what they're going to pray. You know what they're going to pray? You remember when Jesus drove into Jerusalem, riding on the colt, full of an ass? Remember what they said? Hosanna. You know what Hosanna means? Save, Save now. Save now. And so the Lord says, you're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? And so there they are. They're surrounded by enemies. They're going to be crying out together, all of them, in unison. The spirit of grace and supplication. Save now. Save now. Save now. Hosanna. 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 And then it says, as they're crying out, save now, save now, save now. It says, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. So uh, instantaneously this deliverer comes out of heaven on a white horse and the armies are with him. And guess who's going to be riding on those horses? It's going to be us. I don't know whether you've ever been on a horse before. I'm petrified of him, <laughs> but, but we'll be on a horse <laughs> riding with Jesus to deliver his earthly people. That's something. And it'll be just like the seventh cavalry. Remember those old westerns? The seventh cavalry always arrived just in the nick of time. But the shock is going to be they're going to be, on the one hand, immediate sense of relief. A deliverer is coming. But then as they focus more directly and look, it says they're going to look upon me, who they have pierced. And it's going to send them into shock because the last person they ever expected to come to their aid is the one who they hated so much, who they had cried out together, crucify him, crucify him, veins sticking out on their necks, just, uh, just hated this man. And the very one that they despised, they called the apostate. They said he's a blasphemer. That very one comes to their aid. It says they shall look upon me. Me. Whom they have pierced. Then notice it says. And they shall mourn. They shall mourn for him. As one mourneth. For his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him. As one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. You see, if you think about this just for a minute, you, if, if you were surrounded and it looked like you were about to be totally annihilated as a people, and all of a sudden, out of seemingly out of nowhere, comes deliverance, you would expect that they'd be dancing in the streets rejoicing, wouldn't they? I mean, you've been delivered. You've been saved from execution, from death. But instead of rejoicing, they're mourning like, he describes the intensity of like someone who's just lost their firstborn son. The, instead of joy, there's grief. There's incredible grief. They're grieving deeply. And the grief is this. The, it, the awful reality has finally dawned upon Israel. We crucified our own Messiah. And they're going to be absolutely devastated. And it says they're all going to be mourning. It says in that day shall there be great mourning in Jerusalem. Verse 11. As the mourning in Haddon Rimmon in the valley of Negadon, they shall mourn every family apart. Now, that comment on... Uh, Great morning, uh, like the morning it had at Rimmon, the Valley of Megadon. That was when the nation mourned over godly King Josiah being killed. And they're going to be mourning 
but what they've done to their own Messiah. And it says, verse 12, the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, the royal family, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. That's the prophetic house, Nathan the prophet, the family of the house of Levi, uh, that would be the, the religious house apart, the wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, their wives apart. And any of their, their wives apart is that, that everybody will want to get alone and mourn individually. Everybody will be so devastated. We crucified our own Messiah. And they'll just be, well, they'll be afflicting their souls, just like it says in Leviticus 23. Is there any hope for them? They're truly broken. I mean, they're just grieving at what they've done. They are totally broken. Absolute brokenness. Notice chapter 13, verse 1. It says, in that day, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. For sin and for uncleanness. There's a fountain opened. This fountain is going to cleanse them of their sin, of crucifying the Messiah, of their uncleanness, their wickedness through the centuries. It's going to cleanse them. They're going to be a nation is literally going to be born again in one day. That's what's going to happen. Just look at, keep your finger in Zechariah. Just go to Isaiah for a second. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 and verse 8. Isaiah 66, verse 8, says this. Who, is, who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. See, a nation is going to be born at once. They've got to go through a travail. They've got to go through this afflicting their souls. They've got to go through this time of deep mourning and repentance. But then the fountain will be opened. What is that fountain? You know it. You've been singing about it for years. There is a fountain filled with blood. It's drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stains. Amen. See, it says they shall look upon me whom they've pierced. Do you remember what we just read in John 19 of the Lord's Supper? When that statement was made, and other scripture says they look on him where they pierced. And that is when they put that spear in his side. And out of it, that fountain was opened for sin and uncleanness. Blood and water came out. Blood to make atonement. See, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Atonement is made. The water for cleansing. It's wonderful, isn't it? And we, we recognize that. We, we've experienced it. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. But that blood that availed for me and for you will one day avail for this nation. And all Israel, Paul would say in Romans 11, thinking of this event, all Israel, shall be saved. Those that have survived the tribulation, two-thirds are going to be wiped out. It's Romans 11, 25 through 27. <laughs> and the most salient feature we saw was they're going to be afflicting their souls. But there's another aspect of <clears throat> that day, and it's the fact that they are to do no work on that day. Notice verse 28, and you shall do no work. This is back in Leviticus 23, sorry. Leviticus 23, verse 28, you shall do no work in that same day. It is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. 
<clears throat> look at verse 30. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, that same soul I will destroy from among the people. Look at verse 31. You shall go no, do no manner of work. It shall be a statue forever to your generations in all your dwellings. So two things, afflict your souls and do no work. Do no work. Now, that's been Israel's problem, isn't it? Really, their big problem. Look at Romans 10. Romans 10 tells us what the Jewish problem has been. And because there are many who said they're scattered, they're sinful, they're suffering. But kind of the root of it all is, is given here in Romans 10 and verses 1 through 3. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. It says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So what has Israel been trying to do? They've been trying to work for their salvation, haven't they? That's all they've been doing. They've been, and they're zealous. Many of them are zealous. You see them rocking at the wailing wall. I mean, these guys are zealous. And they're working and working and working for a salvation that cannot be worked for. It's a gift, lest any man should boast, you see. And that day on the Day of Atonement, they'll realize no work's going to save them. They have to look unto him who they pierced and they better look in faith Isaiah 45 22 look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there's none else right in other words it's a look that saves just like you remember those that were bitten by the serpent in the wilderness right and the serpent is lifted up what did they have to do to be saved look Look and live, my brother, live, right? They just want to sing those songs. Aren't they great songs? Just look. Look in faith to the uplifted, crucified Savior. There's life for a look at the crucified one. And they're going to stop working. You cannot work for your salvation. You can't. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. Nothing, right? Faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. One of the five solas of the Reformation, sola fide, faith alone. And so that day is a day of atonement for Israel. All Israel shall be saved. Now, what about the church? What about us? Do we have a solemn day coming up? A day of afflicting our souls? Well, the closest thing I can think of is after the trumpet sounds and we're gathered to the Lord, is we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I, I don't think that... Well, I think one look in his lovely face, and we'll all wish we'd done more. I don't think he'll have to say much. I really don't. When Peter had denied the Lord with oaths and cursings, and Jesus came out of Pilate's judgment hall, he said he just looked at it, and Peter wept bitterly. <laughs> and I think there'll be a day. We stand before the Lord Jesus, and everything we've done in our lives that we know was wood, hay, and stubble, we'll say, burn it, Lord. <laughs> In the light of who you are, the only thing that's fit for is the fire. But you know the amazing thing is? It says, every man shall have his praise of God. You'll actually find something good to say about all of us. You'll say a cup of gold, cold water that was given in his name will in no wise lose its reward. And so there'll be something good he'll have to say for every one of us. 
And, and you, you know how I know that? Because I read Hebrews 11. And he says, what more can we say of Samson and Jephthah? Would you put them there? Would you have had Samson? Or what about Second Peter and righteous law? Would you, have, would you have said that about law? I don't think you would, would you? See, sometimes we're harder than God. I think we are. So he'll find something good to say about every one of us. But at the same time, there'll be things about our lives we'll say, we'll say, I played the fool. What was I thinking? One look in his lovely face, and every one of us will wish we'd given him more. Mm. More, so much more. So in a sense, there'll be a, there'll be a sorrow, but there'll be a joy. Because we'll be looking in his face. <laughs> oh, that'll be something. So we move on to our last festival. And that's the Feast of Tabernacles back in Leviticus 23. And that's from verse 33 onwards. And it's, it's really a tremendous contrast to the Day of Atonement because it's all about joy. The salient feature is rejoicing. And so he says, verse 33, the Lord spake to Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, the 15th day of the same month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. For seven days unto the Lord, on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You'll do no servile work thereon. Seven days shall offer an offer made by fire unto the Lord. The eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It's a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, a meal offering, a sacrifice, and a drink offering, everything upon this day. Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, and besides your gifts, beside all your vows, and beside all your freewill offerings, which you give to the Lord, also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep feast to the Lord seven days, the first day shall be a Sabbath. The eighth day shall be a Sabbath. You shall take you on the first day of the boughs of goodly trees and branches of palm trees and the boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Let's just stop there. Well, verse 42, you shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. I would suspect that if you were a little boy, of all the festivals in the year, you would really look forward to tabernacles because you get to go camping in your backyard. Because what they did was they were to build these little booths. And they, you, you see it, you, you go to Israel, you can see if you're there during tabernacles, you'll see that, that everywhere you look there, there's, there's greenery because they, they build these little booths and they get to sleep out. And it's to remember God's goodness to them in their wilderness wanderings when they lived in tents for 40 years and how God was faithful to them, how he provided to them. And it was a time of rejoicing. And of course, it, in many ways, it was, a, it was a great time, this, this time of joy, because um, it was the end of the year. It was, the, it was another harvest festival. It was the corn and the wine harvest. And so it's kind of like the end of the year and all the crops are in. You've already had the barley harvest, you've had the wheat harvest, now you've got the corn harvest, you've got the wine harvest, and everything's in, and you're, in, you're basking in God's goodness and God's provision, and it's a time of rejoicing. And everybody was to rejoice. And it was, it was a lovely time, the Feast of Tabernacles. And I suppose a bit like Thanksgiving in the U.S., I think it's a great, I, I, you know, of all the American holidays, my least favorite is the 4th of July, for obvious reasons. My most favorite is Thanksgiving, of the American holidays. Christmas is not an American holiday, so it's a universal holiday, right? But Thanksgiving is uniquely American. Well, they have it in Canada too, sometime in October. But it's a lovely holiday, isn't it? Because it's good to be thankful. Amen. Now, we shouldn't just do it once a year. It should be all the time, right? We've got a lot. Do you have anything to be thankful for? We have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? But it's a very special time. And so these seven days, the people lived in booths. It reminded them of their pilgrim journey, how God looked after them, even in the wilderness. 
He provided bread from heaven. He provided water out of the rock. He provided meat for them, so on and so forth. And so it was a time of great thanksgiving for God's faithfulness and a time of great rejoicing. By the way, God wants his people to have joy. He, he wants that from us. And one of the ways we can have joy is when we look back at God's faithfulness in the past. It does give us reason to be joyful. Like, if, if you're honest, how has God dealt with you as a person if you look back over your life? Does that give you any reason to be joyful? I think he's been so good to me. I just can't get over it. I know what I deserve. I deserve the hottest hell. That's what I deserve. But he had given me what I deserved. He has been so good to me in every way. So it's good, right? It should give you joy as you, as you come to play his goodness. And they were to look back. And he wants them to do that. Beware lest thou forget. That's the idea. Don't forget God's goodness. Also, joy always follows cleansing. Remember, they just had the Day of Atonement when they've been cleansed. After David had his penitential psalm, Psalm 51, and verse 12, what does he say? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Because joy comes after forgiveness and cleansing. And they've just been forgiven. The fountain's been opened. They've been cleansed. And so there should be joy in their hearts, great joy, because they've been cleansed. And, and of course, sin robs us of our joy, doesn't it? But cleansing restores our joy. And joy leads to sacrifice. Now, we won't take time, but if you were to look at Numbers 29, verse 12 onwards, it lists all the sacrifices that were to be offered during the Feast of Tabernacles. And you know how many there were altogether? 199 sacrifices to be offered. 199. There were 70 bullocks, and some have suggested that the 70 bullocks that were offered that week represented the 70 nations that are found in the table of the nations in Genesis chapter 10. In that Israel was supposed to, as it were, offer sin offerings on behalf of all the nations because his house was to be a house of prayer for all the nations so just interesting you ever wondered why why 199 sacrifices and not 200 like we would think come on round it up 200 you know it would be better than 109 because he's leaving room for one more as you look back over god's goodness and his faithfulness in your life what would the New Testament tell you to do? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so he says, in your joy and in your rejoicing, a fitting response would be, offer yourself a living sacrifice. You can be that 200th one. There's 199, why not be the 200 one? Why not fill the vacancy by presenting your body a living sacrifice? So we want to look at it prophetically. What is it going to mean for the nation of Israel? And for that, we've got to go back to Zechariah again, please. This time, Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14, where we're going to learn about the millennial kingdom, which is going to be a time where God is going to deal with the final piece of the Jewish puzzle. Trumpets, there were scattered people, he's regathered them. They have atonement, there are sinful people, he's cleansed them. Feast of Tabernacles, there are suffering people, and he's going to change all that. And instead of being the heel of the nations, the nations are going to bring their wealth to them. And they're going to be the head of the nations, right? And so when we look at Zechariah 14, we get a little glimpse of what that's going to be like. So look at chapter 14, verse 4. It says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, 
and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north and half of toward the south. And just stop there for a minute. <coughs> Where did Jesus ascend to heaven from? You know where? Mount of, Olives. Mount of Olives. And then the angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come in, in like manner as you have seen him go. So, so his feet left the Mount of Olives. And when he returns to the earth, his feet are going to land where? On the Mount of Olives. And when they touch down on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is going to split in two. It's going to be a great cleavage. And it's going to split in two. And he's going to change the whole topography of Israel. You know why that's necessary? Because there's going to be a millennial temple built from Ezekiel 40 through 48. And it won't fit right now on the current temple now. It's way bigger. <laughs> there's got to be some geographical adjustments. And what he's going to do is there's going to be him standing on the Mount of Olives is going to start a lot of physical changes on planet Earth. Jerusalem actually is going to rise up. It's going to be a city set on a hill. And all the other areas are going to be like a plain. So that everybody is going to go up to Jerusalem. It's going to be amazing. But he's going to start that whole process when he, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. And so he's coming back. He's coming to the Mount of Olives. Jesus is coming back. Look at verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. There shall be one Lord and his name one. Don't you love that? End of political confusion. There's going to be one king over all the earth. And a righteous king at that, right? Not some despot, not some dictator who's, you know, full of malignity, right? He's going to be a righteous ruler who's going to rule in righteousness. He's going to be the king over all the earth. Based in Jerusalem, the place that they said, we will not have this man to reign over us, Jesus shall reign. Where'er the sun is successive journeys run, right? From shore to shore, from sea to shining sea, he's going to be king over all the earth. And there's going to be one Lord and his name one. That's good, isn't it? Not only the end of political confusion, the end of religious confusion. I often tell this story. When I was a kid, a uh, Catholic boy, and I remember when George Harrison of the Beatles brought out My Sweet Lord. You remember that song? Mm -hmm. And I thought it was great. One of the Beatles has become a Christian. I mean, in my understanding of what a Christian was, which is not a biblical understanding at that time. But I thought it was great. Later on, I found that he was not singing about Jesus. He was singing about Hare Krishna. That's who, that's who his sweet Lord was. It was Hare Krishna. It wasn't the Lord Jesus Christ at all. So there's religious confusion, you see, today, isn't there? There are lots of people that think, some think Muhammad or Allah, if you like. I mean, there's confusion everywhere, right? It's going to be ending. It's going to be one king and one Lord. And his name, one. You know who he's going to be? Jesus, my Lord. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that cause for joy? Are you glad? There ain't going to be Republicans and Democrats anymore. I see they're all going to be royalists. Everybody will be a royalist and a loyalist. <laughs> and there'll be one king. And that king is going to be my king, the Lord Jesus. Okay. And so... That time, special time, verse 16, Zechariah 14, says, It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. So what are the festivals? that will be given a special place of prominence in that day will be the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Verse 18, it says, if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. Verse 19, there shall be a punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. So people will go on pilgrimage from all over the earth to Jerusalem. And they'll go specifically to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's interesting when you look at Ezekiel, there's even traffic directions in Ezekiel when you go to the temple. You go in one gate, but you can't go out the gate you came in. You've got to go out another gate because there'll be absolute confusion because all the world's going up there to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Feast of Tabernacles is indelibly connected in the scripture with the millennial kingdom, a time of Earth's unprecedented joy. A time of looking back and being conscious of God's faithfulness through the wilderness years. And now a time of great rejoicing. One king, one Lord, unity on the earth, all the nations coming up to keep the feast of tabernacles. Now let's look at the New Testament for a moment and just consider this. I want you to go to Matthew, please, chapter 16. Matthew 16. And verse 28. Verily I say to you, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, this is kind of a strange verse. Who is he talking to, first of all? Look at verse 24 of Matthew 16 to see who he's addressing when he says there's some of you standing here. Who was standing there? Verse 24 then said Jesus to his disciples. If anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So he, he's speaking to his disciples and he's saying to some of his disciples that some of them will not see death until... They see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now we've got a bit of a problem. Because all of them are dead. And the kingdom hasn't come yet. So we just wasted a whole weekend. <laughs> Is this all false? No. Because when we go to chapter 17, it says, after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into a high mountain apart. And he was, he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses. One for Elijah, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of cloud which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Just stop there for now. I want to suggest to you that the transfiguration was a preview of the kingdom. Uh, I don't have a television, and so, but years ago when I had television, before I was saved, we'd be watching a series maybe, um, and you, you knew a new series was coming because they'd give you a preview beforehand. And when you saw the preview, you knew the series was coming, right? Transfiguration Mountain, God says, I'm going to show some of you, you're not going to see death till you see the kingdom of God. And they got a preview on Transfiguration now. He took Peter, James, and John. So what's the kingdom going to be like? Well, Christ will be there in all his glory. Remember, his face is shining like the sun. His raiment is brighter than, than uh, as white as you can imagine, right? Brilliance, right? Christ will be there in his, his unveiled glory on planet Earth. And Moses is going to be there. Well, there's a problem. 
by the way, isn't it good? You remember Moses struck the rock twice and God says you can't go into the land? Well, God relented and let him go in. He got to go in, didn't he? On Transfiguration Mount. <laughs> He's right there in the land right now. He's enjoying it, right? But Moses is there. He represents believers that have already died. They'll be there in the kingdom age, won't they? And then Elijah. What happened to Elijah? How did he die? Well, actually, he didn't. He was taken to heaven without dying. And so, in the kingdom age, there'll be believers who have died, who are resurrected, who will be in the kingdom, like Moses. And then there'll be those who were taken to heaven without dying, the raptured ones. They'll be there. And then Peter, James, and John represent those that are going to go through tribulation and are going to be alive in the kingdom. And so he got a picture. They all got a glimpse. They got a preview of the kingdom. Now, what does Peter do? When he sees this preview, what is, what's Peter's immediate response? Let us build three tabernacles. Now, some people say Peter would have lost his mind. No, Peter was thinking very biblically. He thought the kingdom was come. And he knew that one of the big features about the kingdom age was keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. He said, put up three tents. It's here. Let's do it, right? Peter's spot on. He's absolutely on his game. He said, let's put up three tents. Because we all say, well, he, he put Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah and all this. Kind of, but, and that may be true. But the main point is, Peter's thinking like a Jew. And a Jew thinks this way. Tabernacles is a foreshadowing of the kingdom age. And when he saw the kingdom in preview, he thought, this is, this is it. Let us put up three tabernacles. So as we bring all this together, I want to just think about this calendar for a moment. And think about it in relation to you and I. Because, by the way, we said, well, there's a, there's a Jewish application. What about an application for us? Well, you know, the Bible says, if you suffer with me, you shall also reign with me. And we're going to be reigning with Christ for a thousand years on planet Earth. And right now, we're in training for reigning. I don't know if you realize you're a king in training. You're going to be a priest and a king on the earth with Jesus for a thousand years. And you're training right now. Isn't that exciting? Training for reigning. But I want to just think about, as we try and kind of pull all this together, I think about these festivals. Passover, you and I, when we understood that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us, we were redeemed by precious blood. Praise God for that. And now we're keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're feeding on Christ. We're living as strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We're removing leaven from our lives. We're involved in bringing in the harvest. And we're waiting for the trumpet to sound. And then we're going to come back with the Lord Jesus. And we're going to reign with him for a thousand years. And we're going to enter into a time of unprecedented joy on planet Earth. Just like the salient feature was rejoicing before the Lord your God. The whole world will rejoice. And all these troubles seem to be over. And the kingdom glory will be seen. And so we've got a bright future up ahead. We really do. And we have a glorious past as we look back to Calvary. And we think of what he did for us on that cruel cross. So much to be thankful for. So much to rejoice in. And so much that we can learn from these face of Jehovah, God's calendar, and how it relates to you and I. May God encourage us as we consider these things. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so grateful for the time we've enjoyed together. We've only been wading in the shallow, scratching the surface, really, of your word. But we're thankful for what we've learned, the accuracy of the word of God, uh, your timing 
your impeccable timing concerning the fulfillment of these first four feasts, and we believe the final three feasts. So, Father, we're just thankful that you're the God of the ages, and your son, the Lord Jesus. What a wonderful thing to think that in the very place where Israel said we will not have this man to reign over us, that Jesus will reign mm -hmm. from Jerusalem over the whole earth. And in that day, he'll be the king of kings and he'll be the Lord of lords. And every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Well, how we look forward to that day. In the meantime, we realize from your word, we've got to be busy. There's a harvest that needs to be brought in before that trumpet sounds. Help us to be busy, occupied till I come, the Lord Jesus said. Or that we might be occupied with the master's business. We'll give thee all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.